Wow, here we are again, folks. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Wow. Do you know if you hadn't got a tidbit from the Word, you probably hadn't got anything. The other day, I was in Brother Larry's office, my good friend. He said, you know, give me a little tidbit, Pete, right here. You're alive on now, so give me one. I got my Bible out, started hunting for a tidbit that would be good to put out to the public for that particular second. I didn't know exactly what God would have me do. And don't remember right now what He did have me do, but I do know that he had me do something out of that Bible. If it ain't out of the Bible, it probably ain't much good anyway. So whatever you do, you got to refer back to the Bible or refer forward to the Bible. But it all has to be in the Bible. <clears throat> do you know there's a great divide today in our churches of what you would call uh, what Paul started in the first churches uh, they are around Corinth and other places in Thessalonica and uh, uh, Galatia and Pontius Galatia and uh, different places where they started churches. But all of those churches had the same message and they were to have unity in the same message. Well, it wasn't long before there was a divide amongst some of them. Some of them had questions that they brought up and said, well, well, this church over here is not doing the same as we're doing. Well, they were different people. They were in a different area. They had different customs. There was a lot of different mannerisms. And when you take those mannerisms of that area, if you went from, I live in Georgia, by the way, and if you uh, left Georgia and went to Wyoming and visited a church in Wyoming, it would not be anything whatsoever, not resemble anything of whatsoever highly of what you do in your church as a general rule in Georgia because uh, we've fallen into customs well the custom has been brought into the church somewhat now you can have the same gospel in every church under different customs and it would look different well during a period of time as the churches were growing Paul was talking to the church about being in one accord and that one accord means that you've got to teach the same book now you may teach it in a different way you may speak in a different mannerism you may do a lot of different things but you've got to come up uh, with the right origin you've got to reveal the origin of the church was started by Jesus Christ on the cross he gave his life for the church which is <clears throat> going to be uh, sitting around the table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you're going to be sitting around that table. Let's look in uh, Romans 15, uh, 1 through 13. He said, Let, uh, let's, let's observe some of the various names. Now we've got in Romans 15, he said, We then that are strong, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. He's saying, so you do it different way you are in your church. Well, are you strong enough to say well, what they're doing in their church? It may be different, but they've come up with the same results. They got soul winners in their church. They got people in the jail ministry in their church. They got people that are evangelists in their church. Uh, and they've got all to go and they believe what Jesus said is the truth they are following to the, the best of their ability what God would have them do and they're just as important as that thumb is on that hand just because that thumb is different than them fingers I don't cut it off that thumb was put there for a reason it was put there to help the rest of this hand grasp and do things so here's this other church and you say well he looks like a thumb to me well you better be quiet and be careful and see what you do you need that thumb you need that thumb <laughs> you cut that thumb off you're in trouble you cut your big toe off and you can't walk cut your little toe off and you can't walk not normal you'll walk all crazy your toes are that important too so all of these little toes and, and little fingers and th fingers and thumbs, we're not all the same. But we all have the same purpose, to grasp the gospel of Jesus Christ and take it to a lost and dying world. Fighting among ourselves is killing God's people today, is killing the church. 
divide in the church of God is not supposed to be. The only way you have a divide and cut asunder or turn loose is if you have somebody, the first admonition, second admonition, third admonition, and they refuse to quit doing whatever it is they're doing that's interfering with the church, then you expel that person. That's not common practice today, and it's, uh, uh, we all hope it doesn't become necessary. We all hope it doesn't become necessary with anybody, because it's not an easy decision. Let's look at the unity in Christ. We then, that are strong, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Do you know, I had some good friends. I, 1972 when I got saved and I, I was in the church and I had been delivered from alcohol, cussing, swearing, cheating, stealing, all that stuff. I still smoked. Well, I had come from the jailhouse so I went back to the jailhouse preaching. I got saved on one Sunday. The next Sunday I was up the jailhouse saying, look, I went up and found out I could get in and speak before the bars and I did. Couldn't read a lick. And uh, got up there and <laughs> I got harassed bad. I didn't know words. I thought Psalms was Peslums and uh, I thought Job was Job and uh, I, I just was in a terrible shape for trying to preach when I couldn't read. And so I had to learn. So I got the Bible on record and I started reading through the Bible on record, listening to it, underlining. I have a Bible right here that I underlined uh, all the way through, uh, listening to it and learning how to do that. He said, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is anybody, the, anybody that you're acquainted with is your neighbor. Anybody that you are acquainted with is your neighbor. Alright, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Everything that a man was reproached of, Jesus said, I did it at the cross. If he will come to me, lay that thing to me, and I will take care of it. I tried to do that with cigarettes, and Jesus said, Hey, I don't smoke, never did, don't want to. <laughs> you just keep your pack of cigarettes in your pocket and, until, uh, until you're ready. And when you're ready, I'll deliver you. Until then, you can try to quit all you want. But until you're ready, just give it to me and say, Look, I'm going to quit for you, Jesus, not for me. I'm not going to quit so that I'll look good, smell good, uh, be clean now, I'm going to quit because you gave your life on the cross for me and it behooves me to keep the things of the world in my life after I'm saved. So, uh, here it is. I'm talking about the original ownership of the Church of Christ was a group of believers. Now, they were the ownership of it. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians uh, 2 and 14. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. It said, For you, brethren, that means they were all like this one hand. They were all brethren. Yes, this thumb is part of the brethren of this hand. Looks different, doesn't it? But it's still part of the brethren of this hand. So they didn't all look the same. They didn't all act the same. This finger doesn't act like this thumb. They both will do a job, but they don't act exactly the same. But they do the job. And he, he said, Brethren, become followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Now these churches were in the land of Judea, but they were also in Christ Jesus. It's like these, these fingers are in the land of the arm, ain't they? They're in the land of the arm, but they're all in the hand. Just like, just what Jesus is saying. These churches are in my hand. My arm is me in heaven. And I'm reaching down with my hand, the church. Now I'm leaving this church there. And I want the churches to do this. For you also have suffered like things in your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Now, uh, this hand can suffer. 
<laughs> this arm gets hurt, and I have to put it in a sling. I can't take this hand and reach out with it. So we need to keep our arm out of the sling so that we can use our hand. What gets your arm in a sling? Well, you got saved. And you got this thing God saying to you, you're a weak Christian. You just got saved. That was me. And I was still puffing them weeds. And uh, I had some real Christians around me that said, hey, just keep working on it. God will deliver you. God will deliver you. I went through one year of fighting that disease that I had of smoking cigarettes. It was a sin disease is what it was. And, and I had it. I had it. I kept it. I, it wasn't just left over. I kept it left over on purpose because I loved it. And I couldn't quit. And then finally I did one day. And I finally gave it to the Lord one day, finally. And he became the ownership 100% of this man. He became 100% owner of this man. I wasn't keeping that particular thing, which was probably uh, more than 10%. Because every time I went to testify, people said, you're saying with your mouth one thing and you're doing with your mouth another thing. The same mouth is doing two things. It's telling the truth over here and denying it over here. And so I had to quit denying. And that's it. Let's look at Romans 16.16 16 and see what that verse says. In Romans uh, chapter 16 and verse 16. Okay. And verse 16 says this. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So when he uses the plural of churches, the churches of Christ salute you. That means any church, if you are a Christian, and you walk into that church, and you are a Christian, you should be saluted. I try my best every single solitary Sunday that passes to shake hands with every person that I, I see that I hadn't seen before. I try to shake with those that I have seen before, but especially with those I haven't seen before and find out a little tidbit about them, how I could help them if they need it, if they're brand new in the church, uh, how I could come beside them and help them, encourage them, and uh, do that. And so, uh, that's what we're supposed to do in the church of Christ. And that's the ownership. God owns that church. If you're in that church, your master and your owner is God. And you can have a servant in between you and God who's called a preacher. And he is the man you are to learn by and listen to and follow if you're in that work and not stray off into some other work or run off. If God put you there, he put you there for a reason. For a reason. Now, in the difference, we had different churches. Now we're pointing out there were other churches in Romans 16 and 16. Let's look at Romans 16 and 4. Verse 16 and 4. Uh, who have for my life laid down their own necks, who not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Wow! Now in that day, that was really saying something. In that day, that was really saying something. Do you know that 40 years ago, that the church that I go to right now even, probably would have never had any black members in that church because it's predominantly white. And if you went over to the black church, there wouldn't be any white members because they're predominantly black. That was a separation divide. That is a picture in the United States of America of what it was back when in Paul's day, Jews and Gentiles did not mix. The Jews walked on one side of the street. The Gentiles walked on the other side of the street, just like in America. We had that divide with color, with races. Now, 
uh, over the years, that divide has been pretty much wiped out. And now we have black people in our church, and I know black churches in our area that have white people. And that's the difference now in the time, how things have grown. That's the way it's supposed to be in the church. You're supposed to take in the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are supposed to take in the Jews when they become a church. And that's what's important. Uh, it, what this reveals is the election of God. God elects to save who he will save. He will save anybody. His election's out there. It's given to you. Everybody. The election of God is out there. You say, well, does that election say that some could die and go to hell, or some should die and go to hell, or some should die and go to hell? No. It says that election out there for you to receive. If you want to, you receive it. I can tell you how, how clear it is. You want to know how clear it is? If you went to England and you drove on the same side of the road you drive on in America, you'll get killed or kill somebody else. When you get over there, it's a different side of the road you drive on. Yes, you got a steering wheel. Yes, you're in a car. And yes, you're driving on a road. But it's different. So you've got to yield to the difference in, in the places. Don't but the difference. If you go over to England and say, I'm going to change this whole system and make it like mine in America. Well, you can forget that. And don't come into a church and think you're going to change it to your way of thinking. You need to be, if you're in that church, you need to think the way that church thinks and the way God thinks in that church. He doesn't think the same way in every church. Some of the things he does in some of the churches are totally different. And, but they're his churches. And they're different. They're different customs. I talked about that earlier in one of the excerpts I did. The customs of the land are different. If I leave here and go to the state of Maine and go walk into a church, it's very, very, very quiet. It's very peaceful. We don't shout in here. If you shout in here, you're out of order. And we might throw you out the door. <laughs> Whew. And then we come over to Georgia and we go in the church. And if you're in there and you don't shout, people wonder, I wonder if they're saved. They don't say, they're like a bump on a log. They don't say nothing. They don't do nothing. They act like they don't hear nothing. They act like they don't see nothing. But when they leave the church, they get on their phone and they go, da, 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 da. I went to that church and this is what I saw. A bunch of crazy people <laughs> saying amen, saying praise the Lord, saying hallelujah, jumping up and down, shouting. Wow. They do it different over there than we do it over here. We do it very reverently. I got news for you. The first church wasn't very reverent as far as that goes. They, they praised God and they shouted and they believed God. Let's look at 16 and 4. We just did. And the redemption and uh, responsibility of the church. What is the responsibility of the church? Uh, I said the word election. By the way, elections like like something hanging there, like an apple tree. Election is hanging on this tree. And you can pick it up if you want to. And you'll be uh, elected to go to heaven. You do that by saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. Now I'm one of the elect. <laughs> the extension of the church is what brings election to people. The extension of the church. Somebody outside saying, hey, Pete, when I was a drunk. God's going to save you one day. God's going to save you one day. I'm praying for you. And God did save me one day. And that brought the election of God to me directly. And then let's look at the fourth thing. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14.33, let's go over there. 1 Corinthians, can we find it? It's in, let's see, Romans... 1 Corinthians, next book. How about that? And uh, 1 Corinthians, and it tells us this, 14 and 33. 
tells us this. 14 and 33 says to us, uh-oh, saints. I bet that's what that's going to be too. These are those that are in. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Wow. As in all churches, as in all churches, saints. Whew. Hey, what makes you a saint? I was a sinner. And I asked Jesus, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart, save my soul. Now I'm a saint. Now I'm supposed to act like a saint. How do you act like a saint? You have the Holy Spirit in you. And he never contradicts himself. I tell you what a contradiction in a church would be like. It would be like taking your thumb, put it where your little finger is, taking your little finger, put it where your thumb is. Did you know this hand absolutely, positively, 100% would not work if you put your little finger over there where your thumb is? And it won't work in the church if you act like you're out of place like moving your little finger to where your thumb is. And so you've got to find your place in the church, fulfill your place in the church. These are instructions. These instructions in this verse were given to saints. And Paul was speaking here, and Paul pertains to all of the churches, not just one. As a union, all the churches as a union, like these fingers all on one hand, not just the church at Corinth. You say, well, this book, Peter, that book you're reading on, it was written to the church at Corinth. No, it was written to all the churches. And what he said when he passed that book to the Corinthians, he said, would you please do me a big favor? And they said, what is that, Paul? Would you pass this on to the other churches? And they said, yeah. So they passed it around, and other churches saw that book written to the Corinthians. Now, the other churches, the Thessalonians, they weren't like the Christian, the, the, uh, the, the uh, Corinthians. The Th over in Thessalonica, they were not. And down over there in, in Pontius Galatia, they weren't the same. Hey, those people that lived on the sea coast were not like the mountain people. But they were all to run their church in the same fashion. Every church you went to in the area, even if they had different dialects, they had different types of people. Uh, a guy, a guy, my father-in-law, if he had ever gone to church, and where where I lived when I was young, I never went out of the house without his hip boots on. He actually got had to go to court on a ticket one time. Walked in the courthouse with his hip boots on. And the judge ran him out of there. I said, "Get out of here, fellow! You come back with a suit on. You're facing a judge. You're in a." municipal place now my father didn't even own a suit he had to go like the kid it killed him worse than the ticket he had to go actually go buy a suit and put it on to go to go before a judge to pay a crazy ticket and uh, it, it, it floored him but if he had gone to church he would have gone to church in his hip boots and he wouldn't have thought a thing about it and do you know what uh, back in the day that they were having the churches in the houses and they just were starting the church, that would have been fine and okay in his area where he was because that's how the people did. They were fishermen. They lived on. They lived as fishermen. They dressed as fishermen. They walked as fishermen. They worked as fishermen. They were 24-hour-a-day fishermen. And here God has called them to be 24-hour-a-day Christians. Well, that changed their inside, but it may not have changed their outside and their way of dress and whatever. And that didn't knock them out of being in the church. So, let's be careful if we are in a church with a group of people that we don't bring everything down and say, well, you got to look like me. Well, you got to have a tie and a shirt on and dress. Personally, my personal thought, I, I could I would feel completely 100% out of place to step behind a pulpit on a podium without a necktie on, a jacket, and look like I'm supposed to look. What I feel like is respect to God. This is respect to the Lord. 
at least with a vest on, so that your vesture is right, is proper. You're in a, a, a vestible place. Uh, you stand before a judge, and, and uh, nowadays judges have to face people dressed in rags, dressed all kinds of ways and everything. But hey, when I was young, uh, you had to, you, you, if you stepped in a courtroom before a judge, you better have some decent clothes on. Because that judge would turn you away and tell you go get some clothes, the right clothes to come in there. There was a time there was respect in this United States of America. Now, we're going to go to another book. Uh, let's look. We, we saw revealed in the 1433 uh, the composure. It reveals the character. In the context of that scripture passage, we see God welding together. He's, he's just like today when you take a welding machine and you weld a piece of iron out on this piece of iron. It's there. And it's solid. God's welding together in love members in the church. That's why when you, you come and you get saved and you come to, say you come to the church I go to, and God convicts you, you ought to be working in this church. You get out of your pew at the end of the service and you walk down front, you meet the preacher, shake hand, and you say, I'd like to be a member of this church. I'd like to be a worker in this church. Now, we don't have a committee that takes you and checks you all out and all of that. We might ought to have so that we don't get some that have crept in unaware. But, so you come in and you become part of the church. So, God's bringing in the Jew and the Gentile together. Now we have a mix of a different races, different peoples, different languages, and different things. Now, in our task of being one in one church is being the same as in another church, so that we could take our choir and another church calls us up and says, hey, would you bring your choir over here uh, Tuesday night? We're having a revival. And we, our church is too small right now to have a choir and everything. Would you get some of your choir over and, and to sing for us? Well, we're part of that church. We're part of that church. Yes, they got a different name. Yes, they're in a different place. Yes, they worship different than we do. But they would like our choir to come sing. What is our duty? Our duty is to go over there and sing. Our duty is to be in oneness with them. And not unproductive, like weak Christians, but productive Christians, doing what is necessary. Uh, not unlearned and full of infirmities. Well, everybody going like this with each other, no. But joined hand in hand, quietly and rightly, and rightly dividing the word of truth, and rightly following the word of God. And so that's the important thing. Now, we are to do some other things. We are to be selfless. <laughs> Delighting in the Lord. Uh, in this context, this uh, uh, one we were in, in Romans, back over in Romans, and uh, Romans 15, verse 3. Let's go back over in Romans 15 and verse 3 and take a look at what it says there. In our notes, we have this 15 and 3. To take a look at. So, isn't it funny how two pages seem to always stick together? 15 and 3 is for even as Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproach of them who reproached you fell on me. That's what Christ said. When you're in a body of believers in a church, you will have things that are reproaches. How do you handle those? You handle them dignantly, dignified. You can say to a person, say, hey, I really feel like it would be conducive for you and better for you if you took a bath before you came. Quietly, in a quiet place. That people can actually smell you and it's offensive to them. Can you do that? Are you at freedom to do that? 
if it's necessary. I am and done it, have done it, done it. Matter of fact, done it more than once. I drove, I drove a church bus for years. I had people get on my bus that the whole bus wanted to get off. <laughs> the whole bus wanted to get off when they got on. It was offensive that they hadn't cleaned up. And so I had to go over there during the week, take them a new pair of clothes. And say, hey, I brought you some new clothes all the way down to your underwear, socks and all. And this Sunday, would you do me a favor? When you get on the bus, people smell you and you, you're an offense because of your smell. But we love you and I want you there, man or woman. And have some, have some clothes for you and everything. Try to keep these in a good place and uh, come Sunday with them. That's how you handle the matter. You don't talk about the person. Everybody's talking about her. Everybody's saying, hey, don't you bring that person over here again. <laughs> I'm saying, let me handle it. You let me handle it. Now I'm going to handle it uh, with kid gloves, but the way it should be handled. And handle it. So we do have a weaker brother. We have a brother that's in some infirmities. We have some that are unlearned. They might not stink in their body, in their flesh, and in their clothes, but they are unlearned yet. They just haven't learned yet. We have people stand in front of our church every Sunday, smoke a cigarette, get the <laughs> last drag, and then one, <laughs> one more, and then when they walk in the vestibule, smoke's still coming out. And you talk about stinking, what stinks worse than a dirty person is, <laughs> is that cigarette, and they don't know it because I, I did it myself, and I didn't know it either. As a matter of fact, then the last of it, when I got saved after and I got delivered, I thought I'd sneak around and burn one, and somebody said, how good was that cigarette this morning? I said, how do you know? Because I can smell it. <laughs> uh, so we are supposed to be selfless. Verse 3, let's read that. Uh, uh, cha uh, chapter 15 and verse 3. Chapter 15 and verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproach of them who reproached you fell on me. Listen. Befriend a person who has a problem. Help that person through his problem. And you will be doing what God would have you do. Well, our time's come and gone. I got an hour message here, but I was only supposed to do a half hour of it. And I'm going to finish it in the next excerpt. And so... I'm going to say I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.